Hello folks, hope you're having a great day today. Today we're going to take a look at the fourth story and final story that I'm going to be looking at in my Planetary Romance series. And today I'm taking a look at Cain of Old Mars by Michael Moorcock um, and so forth. It's been written into the Eternal Champion series and so forth. So it is a part of sort of Michael Moorcock's sort of main uh, thrust with his Eternal Champion stuff. It's in the same uh, multiverse um, that Dorian Hawkmoon uh, or Elric Woman Slayer. And a lot of these other sort of main characters that you might know sort of exist in. So that's fine. We'll be taking a look at that here in a moment. Now, this is the fourth and final of a series of uh, videos that I've done that have kind of showcased the planetary romance genre moving forward, really from when it was really sort of really um, sort of not, not, not created by Edgar Rice Burroughs, A Princess of Mars, but definitely sort of given sort of its mastery, if you will. Just like uh, Sherlock Holmes wasn't the first detective and, and his creator uh, wasn't the first person who created the detective story. Um, that was actually, uh, Edgar, <laughs> it's actually Poe um, who does that. Um, but we, he, he codified it, he strengthened it and so forth. And you can't uh, read a detective story afterwards that's not been written uh, by, and, and thinking of the character of you know, Sherlock Holmes. And, in a, and that was written by Doyle. And in a similar way, Planetary Romance. There were a couple of stories here and there that were written ahead of time, but you know, no, nobody wrote Planetary Romance like like Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote Planetary Romance. His story was heavily influential and had a bunch of books in following it. Now, I only reviewed the first book of that series, A Princess of Mars, for you. Then we took a look at C.L. Moore, who wrote a planetary series of planetary romance stories in the mid '30s for Weird, for the Weird Tales magazine by Northwest Smith. Then we took a look at Jack Vance's Big Planet in the 50s, which was also pushes it forward. So we're, we're basically pushing forward by about 20 years each time uh, from, from, from each of them, kind of see where the planetary romance genre is after advancing the story a little bit. Now we're going to take a look at Michael Moorcock. This is going to be the final one. It's in the late 60s uh, and early 70s and published up through the 70s, 71. Now, normally when I take a look at a trilogy for you or something or a series, what I'll do is I'll actually give you a review of each of the books in the series. And this is going to be the first time I'm not going to do that because and unlike many other series that are out there, in this case, these books are so small uh, and so similar to, <laughs> to each other uh, and such. Uh, and, they're, and, and if you are familiar with the genre at all, they're going to read very much like an homage. Now, it was written by Michael Moorcock as an homage. He was initially asked, hey, do you want to be writing uh, you know, a John Carter uh, uh, Mars sort of um, story? And he said yes. That, uh, he considered Edgar Rice Burroughs uh, and John Carter Mars to be his first sort of favorite stuff when he was growing up. Heavily influential on his first influence as a writer um, and as a person. And he's writing very early. I mean, he's publishing things when he's a teen still. Um, so he's, he's somebody who's been writing all of his life, right? So now he turns to this and he does this. Now this is very much a pastiche uh, to John Carter of Mars. I would recommend that you read John Carter of Mars and Princess of Mars at least before you pick up Cain of Old Mars. Because Cain of Old Mars, while Ace is written by Michael Moorcock, Michael Moorcock is a great writer, um, in, it's, it's, still, it's, still, it's still a pastiche. It's important to understand that going in, right? It'd be like reading something uh, written by Lynn Carter or, or August Derleth in the Cthulhu Mythos before you've read, you know, something by Lovecraft. It, you, just, you just feel weird for you, for you to go in that way. Um, and so forth. It's, you know, no, nothing against all this journalist as a writer. Uh, he'll get better over, and you might go over his first couple, he'll be like, he's not a great writer. But over time, he gets, he actually gets better. He's, he's not that bad as a, as a wordsmith and so forth. Um, it has some interesting turns of phrase in his works, especially some of his later ones. Uh, and so forth. The same thing's true with Moorcock. Um, and yet, he's not, he's not Edgar Rice Burroughs, right? We, <laughs> and his story doesn't have sort of the, the now I, this is, I, I consider this book to be the, probably the easiest of his to pick up and read. Uh, you know, he has sometimes some, some stronger ways of writing, some harsh, har harsher ways of writing and so forth that can be tense um, and dense and he, can, he will get a lot of story out of a few pages um, as a result. Um, he was a master of that and that's why I'm actually recommending this, this is book for you entire. Here, let me, let me kind of show you. There are three books in this series, City of the Beast, uh, Lord of the Spiders and Masters of the Pit that are by Cain of Old Mars and the first page obviously is going to start on page one, hundred, uh, one, right? The second book, and that's a book book, right? Lord of the Spiders begins on page 116 in my collection. That's 115 pages in. Masters of the Pit, page 219. I'm sorry, 229. So that's another 113 pages long. And then it finishes on page 331. So it's 331 pages. That means an average of 110 pages a book. Think about that. <laughs> you can spend like two or three hours and read a book. You can read a book a day. You can read 
all three books in one day if you really were ambitious. And, you know, this is easily a trilogy that you could read on a flight um, and so forth on a flight on the way there or the way back. It's very, very easy to read. For that reason, I'm just going to give it to you all here at once and so forth. And also, again, um, because it's pastiche um, of and very much kind of in this sort of planetary romance. But by now, what you're seeing in the genre is people are so fond of Edgar Rice Burroughs that instead of moving his story sort of forward, like, like Big Planet did with Jack Vance, which is a very different story, although it's in the genre, or um, that C.L. Moore was doing with her characters. Um, one of the things now you're seeing is, is more of a sort of a, a throwback. And this is not un unlike what you were seeing at this time for H.P. Lovecraft either. For example, the first people that wrote H.P. Lovecraft were, when he was writing at that time, were pushing the stories in the genres of the Cthulhu mythos. And people who were writing, you know, for the next 20 years, uh, were so forth, were expanding his mythos um, and so forth. But then when you had the, you know, Lynn, Lynn Carter and some other folks that are writing in the 60s and 70s, uh, instead of expanding the mythos or adding things to or something like that, they were just kind of going back and rewriting uh, the, the, the same things um, in more of a pastiche during this time. It's also not uncommon for them to be doing that for Conan either. Um, by this time, instead of expanding Conan or building on Conan, they were kind of pastiching him and so forth. Um, and, then, and, and, and then it's not until like about 1980 or so that the Cthulhu mythos really will sort of take off um, and, and kind of leave behind this sort of a pastiche roots. Um, and the same thing is true for, you know, Conan stories too. So there are going to be some great Conan stories that are going to be written particularly in the comics that kind of push Conan forward, uh, re-embrace Conan's roots and Howard's roots and so forth. Um, and I think there's a few different writers who did a very good job at that. But I know particularly say that's particularly true at, uh, at the comics. Uh, and so forth. I think there's a couple of writers out there like Roy Thomas who really got uh, Cooney and uh, who the character was and who Ro Robert E. Howard was as his writer uh, and so forth. But anyway, uh, that's neither here nor there. The point is, is that this was happening in other popular works too. And by this time, you're not having that with Cain of Old Mars. Um, with this work with Michael Moorcock, one of the things that you're seeing is that you're seeing, um, uh, this is now more of a pastiche. Uh, it's, 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 it's an homage. It's like, this guy did such a great work, I want to do it too. <laughs> I want to write it, I want to have it out there, and so forth. This is, this is something I would wish I would have read. And so it's very fun and very easy to pick up. And I think it's much easier to pick up. And again, very fast as a read. So let's take a, just, just a quick look at it because again it's it's, it's short um and michael moorcock is a fun writer um and i've already pointed out he's been one of my favorite writers at various times but michael moorcock himself will tell you that he is a not he he's he's, he's he, he will call himself a bad writer with good ideas <laughs> and he says and I, i'll probably mention this in probably all of his reviews that he would rather be that than a you know a good writer with bad ideas and so forth i, I would call him probably more like an average or, or above average writer he's not going to be the best writer that's like a jack vance or something but he is a very strong strong but he's still good um he you know there's reasons why he published a lot of books there's reasons why the uk considers him to be a, a, a an absolute treasure literally speaking and who's transcended his genre decades ago so you know there are reasons for that it's not because he, he's not that good of a writer <laughs> you know i get it he's a great writer in my opinion but anyway let's take a quick look so basically what's going to be happening is you're going to have Kane of old mars and basically Kane, um and it's called old mars because what moorcock will do basically is he's going to have um the uh mars that the character's being sent back to um is actually back in time um the current mars that we know is also sort of lost and destroyed and so forth but the old mars is still there the old mars is still happening uh and so forth um and still so he can still write these stories fresh but still have a dead mars in the future and then you can also kind of see what happens with that so he goes to mars when it's dying out and so forth in the past which is an interesting i think perspective to give the genre i think it's a little, it's a little bit fresher i don't uh, by sending him back in time and making a time travel story, I think it strengthens the story uh, and so forth. But anyway, it's going to happen basically by Cain telling um, um, his, his story uh, to folks after he's come back. So you'll get a chance for him to go back out there and then come back. And I think this is a really safe way for Moorcock to tell a story because you know when you use that, that you know the first person uh, past tense this is what happened the person survived they may be kind of sitting back in a chair smoking a cigar talking about how maybe I got some scars from it but I, but I survived you know <laughs> uh, I'm going to survive the story and so forth and I think that by doing that setting it in the past and so forth he gives it this sort of comforting feel to it that I think is very clever and very different than I think most of the planetary romance stories that you'd see since then. Uh, but uh, but uh, but I, I enjoy that he kind of changes it up a little bit by setting it in the past and by changing its tense a little bit too. Um, but anyway, uh, be, be that as it may, <laughs> uh, basically he's going to be telling his stories of himself in old Mars and his various travels there. Now, it's 
Old Mars is very much like the Mars that um, was created by Edgar Rice Burroughs. It's very Barsoomish, uh, which is the, the name of the planet that the people in Mars, in Burroughs' world, call itself. They call it Barsoom. So you basically want to just distinguish that Mars from other Marses in planetary romances or stories or novels. You'll probably, you'll typically want to call it Barsoom. And uh, the, the world that Kane is going to describe that he's gone back to um, and so forth is one that's definitely, definitely one that seems very, very similar to Barsoom. There are various races on happening and so forth. Now, he's going to be adding to it this sort of eternal champion feel to it, too. That's been added, uh, and so forth. Um, and in uh, all of Moorcock's works, there's this eternal champion uh, where somebody is sort of the... Uh, on, on all these various planes in the multiverse, there's this aspect of this person that appears that's, that's in a champion, uh, who's a champion for the, uh, and sometimes he'll fight for the law, sometimes he'll fight for chaos, he's typically kind of a champion for balance and so forth on these different planes of existence. And you have all these different characters from Elric to Hawkmoon to so forth who are all these different aspects of this same person who exists in all these different sort of places and times and so forth. So old Kane is, basi so Kane is basically going to be the eternal champion of old Mars. And he's going to go back to it and help them out with a number of various things. And that's basically the, the main plot line of the book trilogy. So I'll end it for you there. I'll let you go ahead and take a look at it. It's a lot of fun. And again, it's very easy to read. Now, I do think there's a one weird thing that Moorcock does in this story. I don't know if I'll make sure I mention it here. The main bad guy, she's, well, actually, she's a bad gal. Um, but the main, the main antagonist for the first two books is not in the third book. And I've actually not even mentioned in the third book. Um, and so forth. So you're going to be left to wonder, like, what happened to her? <laughs> uh, is a question that you're going to be at reading as a reader. Now, one of the things that Michael Moorcock has done is in his, a lot of his sort of later sort of uh, edits and so forth, he'll go through and kind of edit his works because he wrote a lot of these works very quickly, especially the ones that he wrote early in his career and in a very, very quick clip. I mean, the guy was publishing tons of novels. I mean, he was like outpacing King. Now, his novels were short. That was probably one of the reasons why. But the, he was... <laughs> he's, Publishing like a ton of novels at a time. I mean, if you put out five or six novels a year, you would not be surprised, right? Especially in early on in his career, uh, or in the 60s and 70s and such. So he, he he oftentimes would go back, fix continuity errors, adding characters, change names to make them you know consistent with previous things, those sorts of things. Um, flesh them out, and sometimes fix up some of his bad writings in a couple of places that kind of stuck through, and so forth. So if you go back into these edited collections that you have, like the one that I'm going to have here, and I'll link it to you in the comments below, so you can check it out but in this one he doesn't re-add her way back in which to me says that this was his intent all along was to have her be disappeared to have her not uh, you know to what happens to her is a mystery and i think that you know i can certainly see why he would want to do it i think there still should have been like maybe a, a line or two that mentions it uh, and so forth uh just so you as a reader will know that she went off and she's doing something else she was reformed Although based on her character, I don't know if that would be likely. But again, <laughs> she, she died or something like that. Or, you know, or, or that the character, or, or that Kane is like, I don't know what happened to her either, but at least we get that sort of <laughs> line. But there's nothing. She's not mentioned it at all in the third book uh, and so forth. But, and it's, it's okay. The books, books live, there are planetary romances. You can have characters that come and go uh, and so forth. They're just fun adventures on another planet where that planet is the story, right? Um, and, and on these crazy planets where all these fun things are happening. And, and again, by set, I think there's a lot of things that Moorcock do, did well in this. But I do want to also point out that there is this little weird thing in there with the, uh, the antagonist, uh, who's actually pretty good. I like her a lot from the first couple of books. She's not in book three at all. She's not even mentioned in book three at all. So there you are. Have you read and that, There's Old Kane of Mars. If you've read it, I'd be happy to engage you with it. Feel free to check it out. And again, I'll link you to it below so you can go ahead and purchase it and ch check it out. And I'm, I don't link you to a collection like mine, too, um, so that you can read all in one sitting, <laughs> one week, uh, in back-to-back -back days, or whatever you want to, because it's so short, uh, and so forth. And again, this is going to kind of end our Planetary Romance series. Um, so the, the, I think the last of these books was written in 71. Um, so again, that'll kind of push it forward about 20 years each time. We started it in, in, um, in 1911, uh, and so forth, and now we finished up in 71. So that's very much 60 years later. Every 20 years, we've done a check-in. So that was very much, I think that's very appropriate, and so forth. And we'll leave this genre there and again this was i thought a fun a fun way to, to pick up uh what what i was doing after i did my cthulhu mythos stuff which there's nothing farther <laughs> away from the cthulhu mythos at all than planetary romance besides <laughs> so fiction and fantasy um and so forth um so i figured that would be a, a fun way to kind of move on uh and so forth uh from, from the end of my uh, series of, of horror uh, and specifically from the, the from the cthulhu mythos 
and so forth. So there you are. Um, feel free. I love to engage you with it further and so forth. If you like this video, please feel free to hit that subscribe button. There's going to be a lot more videos like this to come uh, where we're doing reviews of a lot of old classics or forgotten works like this um, or things that you never had a chance to go and read but you may have heard about. Happy to engage you with that further. And hey, finally, I want to thank you so much for taking some time out of your day because if you watched all the way to this video, man, you invested some time in them, in, in, in it. Uh, and, we, and I just want to thank you again for that. Uh, that's very humbling that you did that. So thanks. You have a good day.